Good morning. This is the South Carolina Department of Disability Special Needs Commission meeting. Today is March the 17th, 2022, and it is 10.02 a.m. And I call this meeting to order. Commissioner Blackwood, would you read the notice of meeting statement, please? Yes. A meeting notice announcing the date, time, and place of the March 17th, 2022 commission meeting was distributed March 15th, 2022 to appropriate media and other groups or individuals who have requested notification. The announcement and agenda were posted at the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs Central Administrative Office and on the website. Americans with Disabilities Act. The public has been notified that accommodations such as interpreters, mobility assistance, or other assistance will be provided to individuals with disabilities and special needs if requested in advance. Okay. Um, welcome to the meeting this morning. Mm -hmm. Happy St. Patrick's Day and happy Brain Injury Awareness Day. I see everyone has on their green today and we're excited to, to have you all here celebrating both St. Patrick's Day and Brain Injury Awareness Month. Um, this morning, we're going to look at our agenda as you see before you. Um, is there a motion to accept and amend the agenda? So moved. I would like to amend the agenda. Okay. okay. I unmoved. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. I'd uh, like to make a motion to amend the agenda under um, the uh, item number 14 on the agenda, which is um, for executive session. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to elaborate on the personnel matters to say um, that we um, are regarding executive level positions and receipt of legal advice for a threatened legal claim concerning a personnel matter. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second on the motion? Okay. Motion and a second on the floor. Um, any discussion on the matter? Yeah, quick, quick question on the on, on the issue under the executive session. I don't mean this to, to take long, but but you, you amended C, the personnel matter. Yes. Why do we have to do that if it's a personnel matter? Just just trying to understand. Um, um, they just ask for more elaboration on it. So yeah, under, yeah. under executive session, it sort of. Expands out a little bit to, yeah, to what you need to do. You're advised by legal to do yeah. Oh, the lawyer said do it. Well, that's, <laughs> like, that's like that's like my wife telling me what to do. <laughs> said, don't ask it. Don't, don't say anything else. I'm doing it. Man, don't even make eye contact. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, well, you're one of them too, but anyway, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we did receive legal. I, I apologize. Yeah. I just that's tried. Okay. 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 I think I was saying that. All right. So we have a motion second. Any other questions? Discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. So accept, aye. Accepting the amendment, excuse me, with the, accepting the agenda with the amendment. Yes. All right. Very good. All in favor, aye. We, the motion carries and the um, a, a agenda is approved pending that one um, exception. We, yeah. we change. All right. Invocation. Chairman Miller. That is great. All right. I find Help us to be a source blessing to those that we are going through difficult that are going through difficult times. Fill our workplace with peace and remove anything that may bring strife. Guide us as we assist people with disabilities, their families in meeting needs pursuing possibilities and achieving life goals and to minimize the occurrence and reduce the severity of disabilities through prevention. In Jesus name, I pray, we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right, then we have the February 17th minutes that have been submitted to each commissioner with your packet and put on the website. Um, will you please, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes as written? Are there any amendments? I have one amendment to the It's not unusual for me, I know, coming from this chair. That's all right. Um, but although I did, did have to do it last time. Um, but it says, Commissioner Mill read a note expressing his thoughts regarding his reappointment. And I think it should say regarding his being replaced by the governor, not his reappointment. Okay. He wasn't reappointed. No, but he was probably speaking about his seat's reappointment, which is why that I think it's still accurate. 
I mean, he, he was speaking about the reappoint the reappointment, right? No, actually, and, what, well, it says his reappointment. So it should say okay. maybe it should say the seat reappointment. Yeah. But it shouldn't say his reappointment because he was not reappointed. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So we should say maybe we should say his seat reappointment. Okay. His seat being reappointed. Well, no, no, his seat reappointment. Any other changes to the minutes? All in favor of that change, please send the file by saying aye. Aye. <coughs> All opposed? All right. All in favor of the um, of the minutes being approved, please send it by saying aye with the amendment in place. Aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carries and the minutes are approved with that one change calling. All right, commissioner's updates. Commissioner, um, we have a new commissioner this morning. Um, I welcome Michelle Woodhead to our commission. I've had the opportunity to meet with her. And um, Michelle is from Rock Hill. Um, and um, I'm gonna let her introduce herself to you all this morning. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us. She had already had a trip planned to Florida for business. So she had to be out of town, but she is joining us virtually this morning. Michelle, welcome. Welcome, thank you everyone and good morning. Um, I'm just gonna introduce myself and, and share a little bit about myself um, with you with you all. Um, again, my name is Michelle Woodhead and I am a mother of two daughters, um, been married almost 30 years um, and uh, I work full time. I'm a corporate senior corporate tax director um, for a, a global company where we uh, file taxes. I'm responsible for tax compliance for all the U.S. states and for our main company as well as multiple subsidiaries. So um, that's quite the full-time job and I've been also doing that for about 29 years. So um, I love my job and I'm very engaged and my most important job of course is being a mom. Um, my oldest daughter is uh, 24. She's graduated from college and working out in the real world. Um, following in my footsteps, she's going into accounting, so I'm proud of that. Um, my youngest daughter is 18. She is a freshman at Clemson University right now, and um, that's that's why I've uh, I'm here today because I want to share my experiences um, with my youngest daughter. Um, I'm a mom of a special needs child, which is my youngest daughter, McKenna. Um, three years ago, almost four years ago now, uh, June 25th, 2018, she suffered a spinal cord injury during a jet ski accident. She broke her neck um, and she is fused at the C7, C6, C7 um, vertebrae. So she is paralyzed um, chest down and um, she has limited hand function, but she is strong of her body. Um, of course, as a parent, uh, that's obviously one of the toughest things that you can get that call for. It happened the summer before her sophomore year of high school. Uh, she um, she was a, an elite soccer player, so she was quite the athlete, very adventurous. And we, we got the call. We went to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, spent months there for inpatient, learning how to deal with her injury, um, dealing with using a wheelchair, the medical staff, just, you know, our life had immediately changed. So it was a lot to, to go through, it was a lot to handle. Being released, we have been doing doctor's appointments for every every type of genre you can imagine, pulmonology, urology, endocrinology, cardiology, neurology. Um, and we still do those appointments on a regular basis with her. Um, we also always go through physical therapy, um, occupational therapy, recreational therapy. Um, our goal for her from the very beginning was try to make her as independent as possible. And I'm happy to report she's she's doing well. She is, like I say, she is at Clemson. Um, she has 
despite her challenges, she's moving forward. She stays positive. We're both a trauma survivor volunteer. Um, she also um, volunteers to talk with other peers going through the same thing she is at a young age. Um, and she has also remained an athlete. Um, I have tried to encourage her and give her every opportunity possible. There's a lot of research, um, it's definitely a lot of research to see what's out there available to keep her active in ath athletics. Um, she's very big in adaptive sports um, and she water skis, she snow skis, she plays quad rugby for a team outside of Charlotte. Um, importantly, she plays wheelchair tennis at Clemson University and she is helping them start their adaptive sports program and she is being a leader on that and I think it's great. So, you know, she's paving the way for others behind her. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, to be on this position with you all and working with you all and um, sharing my experience and, and doing that to, to make a great team. Thank you so much, Michelle. We're excited to have you on, on the commission. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Michelle? I just want to welcome her to the commission. Commissioner Miller, and he's welcoming you to the commission. Thank you very much. <coughs> We're welcome. If you have any questions throughout the time, please don't hesitate to ask us. Um, you know, I know Commissioner Cohort joins you. He's fairly new on, on our commission. He's our newest member, but we've all been in your seat, so we know how it feels to be brand new here <laughs> and um, are more than happy to, to, to help and guide you through this process. Thank you very, very much. And I look forward to meeting everyone in person. Yeah, Thank you. she'll be back next month. So. Yes. All right, other updates, Commissioner Miller. I don't have anything. Nothing. I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate my friend behind us here with the camera that is volunteering his time to help the commission with um, taking some pictures of us and taking the pictures of those that are in here to um, make our media department a little better in that regard. So we are thankful to have him here. Mr. Okay. Carr. Uh, Disability Advocates Day uh, enjoyed being there. I talked to a lot of people, and I was really pleased to find out that the uh, fee for service is working reasonably well. Yes, Mr. Yes, uh, nothing except I have a new and profound respect for the um, COVID Omicron variant. Do you? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> We've missed you. <laughs> well, I, 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 I have not missed any meetings, no. but it's all been by it's all been by phone you. in the last yeah. three months. So. Well, it's good to have you back with us here in person. It really is good to have you back in person. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Buckley. Yeah, I have a few things. You know, March has been a very busy month for the disability community. Um, I want to thank the South Carolina Assistive Technology Program, the Center of Disability Resources, and the DD Council uh, and sponsors for hosting the 2022 Virtual <laughs> Assistance Technology Expo. It was held on March the 1st. The sessions covered really a variety of topics about new technology to increase in, uh, mobility, innovation for accessibility for people with disabilities, and it was just really great information um, shared. And so I um, encourage people to go on to the School of Medicine website. They're going to post, they did a recording of the um, expo, and so they're going to post that in the coming weeks um, there on the website. So um, I highly encourage um, DDSN to take a look at some of the innovation that we might maybe one day be able to use and yes. to help our um, our population be more independent with through technology and through um, mobility um, resources mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature. That was a great program. I enjoyed that as well. It yes. was it was really very, very well done and had a variety of topics yes. that you can kind of pick and choose from. And it was just really, really good. Um, I, too, um, attended the um, Disability Awareness Day. It was uh, coordinated by the South Carolina Partnership of Disability Organizations. And so I thought they did a really good job um, uh, with the agenda, the speakers. Um, uh, and I wanted to thank um, Chairman um, Rawlinson for representing DDSN. 
um, and the commission um, as a presenter um, during the, the uh, presentation. Um, it was wonderful to see so many DDSN boards and providers there. Um, I also want to highlight that March is national recognition um, for many disabilities. And um, of course, we know that Brain Injury Awareness Month is this month. Um, we're going to hear more about that um, in just a little bit and the issues around brain injury. Um, it's, it's also Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. It's Epilepsy Awareness Month. It's Trisomy Awareness Month. It's <clears throat> World Down Syndrome Day on March 21st. And it's also Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month. And I want to take a minute and just uh, share a little bit about Cerebral Palsy since we all have the privilege of being on this commission with um, Barry Malfres, who, who has Cerebral Palsy. So I wanted to just read that Cerebral Palsy is a group of disorders that affects a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. It's the most common motor disability in childhood. And um, its um, symptoms can vary from person to person um, pretty significantly. So um, that is my update. Wonderful. I appreciate you doing that for mm -hmm. me, for us today. Um, I did enjoy Disability Advocacy Day mm -hmm. at the State House. Um, I know Commissioner Woodhead joined us. That was her first day. She came up to Columbia and, and got to experience that. I saw Commissioner Coher. We didn't get to speak, so I'm from a distance. I saw Commissioner Blackwood. And um, it was a very good day. I, I enjoyed visiting with our consumers, talking with the with the providers, and actually really understanding their their issues and their concerns. And um, like you said, Commissioner Kamara, the ones I talked to are very pleased with how um, Food for Service is going, which I was glad to hear. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was my honor to be able to speak on behalf of GDA. So that unfortunately, our commissioner, <coughs> our executive director, had to leave town on a family emergency. And so at the last minute, I was called to speak. And so I hope I did you all justice at the last minute. Um, well, well, I, it was very last minute. I will tell you that, but I, I pulled it together. Um, so we appreciate you all being the ones of you who were able to come. I hope that you all will join us again for future events like that. Um, I know that we are looking at doing some some things next year, and hope that we'll be able to do some days up at the, at the on the, the state house grounds as well. So, um, all right, we're going to go now into our public input section. Uh, I do want to remind those who are uh, requested to speak that um, it is the commission's <coughs> pleasure. Um, to allow you to speak if we choose. Um, we do want to emphasize that we do not allow anyone to speak to us who is has pending litigation against any of the members of the commission or the commission itself or the agency. Um, we, we do offer those folks the opportunity to submit written comment that we read into the record for up to three minutes worth. So it, um, it, it actually out balances out the public participation while also ensuring that pending litigation is not improperly raised. Um, so, to start with, we will have Ms. Sibby Region um, with us. Is that correct, Sibby? Yes, welcome, Ms. Sibby. And your husband, Tyrone. Tyrone. Okay, welcome. Glad to have you all with us. Good morning. We're the parents of Akeem Anthony Region, age 38. We would like to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share our son's COVID journey with you all. First, I would like to provide a brief, a brief background on Akeem. Akeem lived at home until the age of 30. He went to dialysis three times a week, day programming, two days a week, and he participated in all of our family events. When Akeem became a resident of the DDSN facility in Dorchester County, he came home every other weekend and of all holidays. My husband and I attended every doctor's appointment and participated in dialysis monthly meetings. November 2020, November 2020, the week before Thanksgiving, we were informed by Akeem's house staff that he's refusing to walk and he crawled to the dining room table. 
the huge facility is only 10 minutes away from our house. The group home is 10 minutes away from our house. And we are fortunate to have that. Uh, my husband and I went to the group home. The key was sitting on his bed. He didn't appear to be in distress. I said, a key, it's time to go home. He didn't move, which was unlike him. I asked him if he was hurting. He replied, no. My husband began to examine Akeem's leg and feet. When he touched Akeem's toes, he grimaced. An orthopedic appointment was scheduled. My husband and I transported Akeem to the appointment. X-rays were um, obtained. The orthopedic doctor said Akeem had three fractured toes. His bones are brittle. No one in the group home knew anything, how anything, how any of this occurred. Akeem wants to wear a boot for several weeks. That didn't happen. The next morning, staff called requesting assistance transferring Akeem from the bed to the wheelchair and the wheelchair to the van and for my husband to meet them at the Dialysis Center. Okay? There was only one staff on duty. For the next three weeks, three times a day, my husband and son repeated this process. When I questioned the house staff, um, again, about staffing, she was told only one person was assigned to work. I spoke with the residential director. She said she was not aware of the staffing shortage. She ensured the adequate staff would be there for Akeem's dialysis appointment. Well, that didn't happen. December 28th, I received a call from the um, DCI Dialysis, Dialysis nurse saying Akeem was ill and Akeem was being transported to MUSC. My <laughs> husband and I met Akeem at MUSC. I stayed in the exam room with Akeem until he was diagnosed with COVID and transported to ICU. My husband and I called ICU every day for updates. Day 12, one of the ICU nurses called, stating Akeem was being transported, transferred to the Children's Hospital ICU, and I could join him, but I had to adhere to the following requirements. I had to stay with him 24 hours a day for a minimum of two weeks. I agreed. I said, please let me know what time I should be there. I was prepared in the next two hours to spend two weeks in ICU with my son. We had good and bad days. Palliative care was called twice. I cried every day, beginning with December 28th. Three weeks later, Akeem was transferred to Ashley Towers at MUSC. The first week I stayed round the clock with him. I began experiencing back problems and I couldn't sleep. No, 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 any of you on just one second. All right, Ms. Regent has expired her three minutes. Will you all agree yeah. to allow her to move forward? Yeah, tell her to go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just had to verify that with the, with the commission. Go right ahead. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to stay at a hospital, to sleep on those little chairs, yeah. okay. and to be there 24 hours a day. Yeah. So I saved that for the entire first week. I called the Keem service coordinator and asked if there was staff to come in and to stay during the nights with the Keem. I was told no, no staff was available. So I said, um, could y'all provide respite during the day for someone to come in and stay with the Keem? I was again told no, they cannot do this. We paid for staff to come in and stay at the hospital with the Keem at night. My husband stayed during the day. I stayed at the evenings and we did that for the remainder of two weeks there. <clears throat> from there, Akeem was transported. He was trans. He was discharged from MUSC um, in March, and he went to Oak Brook Rehab Center. He stayed at Oak Brook Rehab Center for four weeks. The third week, while he was at Oak Brook Rehab Center, we went to a planning meeting. We were told at the planning meeting by DDSN um, staff that Akeem was no longer able to return to his group on placement due to his medical needs. This was at the discharge planning meeting. We had no idea he was not going back. Akeem was to be discharged in OP. Akeem was discharged home to us. We didn't have a ramp. We didn't have a wheelchair. We didn't have a hoiler. Akeem is total care. My husband, myself, and my son, we did that for about six weeks. 
Um, Uh, while the king was at home with us, he received nursing support uh, once a week, physical therapy, RT once a week, and we had a home aid two weeks, two times a week. Two weeks later, a plan of care meeting was virtually held with the Dorchester Board of Disability, their residential director, their service director, and their medical um, doctor. So at that point, uh, we were expecting Keen to be transferred to Parsons, which is their intermediate care, intermediate care, intermediate care facility. Okay, we were told by the medical doctor of uh, Parsons that a Keen um, level of care cannot be met at Parsons because the nurse is only there for 16 hours a day, and the Keen needed 24 hours of nursing. Okay, so at night, the only requirement he needed was to be on the CPAP. Um, so I was told that the days, the, the night staff could not monitor the CPAP machine. I thought that was ludicrous, that they could not provide training for the staff. Okay, and so while we're at the meeting, um, I, asked, I asked the director, who is responsible for obtaining placement for a team at this point. He said nothing. Um, he told me that Akeem's name would be placed on the critical needs list. Immediately, I called my friend Julia Martinelli, the Director of Accessibility. Within one week, Akeem was placed at the Coastal Center. The Coastal Center was a lifesaver for us. Finally, Akeem was in a place where people were aware and knew how to um, take care of someone with a disability. Um, so my husband just told me, I forgot to say that our son is Down syndrome. Um, well, Akeem stayed at the Coastal Center for six weeks. He received awesome care at the Coastal Center. Every time I would call to the Coastal Center, uh, speak to the nurses there, the staff. We went to visit Akeem every day. They took the best care of Akeem. Akeem never once reached out to say he wanted to go with us. So we felt good about that, that he was finally at a place that he felt safe. I mean, you just don't know the feeling to have your child at a place where somebody really cares, cares for them. August 1st. 2021, Akeem was admitted to MUSC for respiratory failure. He was on the floor at MUSC for one week, and we provided 24 hours of care for him while he was on the floor. He was transferred to ICU for respiratory failure. Fast forward, September 30th, Akeem got a trach and a pay to. Placement meetings were held. DDS and staff never attended any of the meetings, and they were invited to the meetings. If you have a trach and you are on dialysis, there are very few options for you in the state of South Carolina. And USC staff found placement for Akeem in the state of Georgia. The hour of six and a half hours away from us. In order for Akeem to be successful and to continue to make progress, he needs physical contact with his family on a daily basis. If Akeem went to Georgia, it would require me relocating to be there with him <clears throat> to ensure his safety and for him to see a familiar place and for Akeem to participate in therapy. My husband and I, we have been married over 40 years. This would require me locating placement for myself in Georgia and my husband staying here. Um, financially, we could not afford for me to stay in a hotel or stay with anyone out there. I'm doing that job. 
MUSC continue to call um, the LTEC centers in South Carolina. I call all the LTEC centers on a weekly basis. Uh, still no vacancy. Family expectation. Working to return to the coastal center. The regional center serves as a vital and necessary service to our loved ones who need a higher level of medical care than they can receive at home or in community placements. They are operated by the state of provide 24 hours of service. Um, supervision and treatment to the most fragile individuals served by DDSM. Our goal is for a kid to be admitted to Viber. Viber is the LTAC, it's in Mount Pleasant. The drive is only 30 minutes away from our house. This still would require for us to be with the chemo all day. The hospital's not requiring that. This is something that we would do for a kid to ensure that he is successful at Viber. Viber won't commit to admission until a discharge placement is secured. MUSC Director of Medical Care, Viber's Administrator, and DCI Dial Dialis Regional Coordinator would like to meet with the staff at the Coastal Center. The Director of the Coastal Center has refused to participate in the meeting. How can the Director of the Regional Center refuse to participate in a meeting when Akeem is still supposed to be served by CDSN. My husband and I were informed by the director of the Coastal Center. Her facility cannot accommodate our son's need, and we, and we should check with Viber. Again, we are left to, sec to secure a placement for our son. At your December 16th meeting, a question was raised. If a, if a facility has a bed and not enough staff, is there a consequence for the facility? I don't remember anybody actually responding to, to that, okay? Akeem has been at MUSC since August 1st, 2021. I visit Akeem six days a week for a minimum of six hours a day. Our daughters rotate on Saturdays to take care of Akeem. MUSC staff has learned how to take care of a individual with a disability. It took a lot of training from us to get the staff to where they are um, because they would just generalize and think <clears> that <throat> general treatment would work. We know that that does not work and everyone is an individual. It took us a while to get the staff to that point. We're finally comfortable with the keen being in the ICU, okay? And I think I want to end with that. My whole thing with the disabilities board is if this board is responsible for taking care of our most fragile individuals, I'll just leave it like that. You are responsible for taking care of our most fragile individuals. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here today. All right. Um, One look, question real fast. Is he still in ICU and in MUSC today? Yes, he's been there over 180 days. Anything else? I, I've sent written comments. Are they going to be read into the record? Um, I have not received those. Okay, I sent them last night. I'll give. I'll be happy to give you okay. the. We'll be happy to get those. And here's the handouts. Thank you. <coughs> um, I, can't, I can't take the computer. Okay, I sent them to you and to. Um, Senator Thomas, perhaps he could read it. Um, if you won't let me read a, it. Well, well, I do have a question. Um, yeah, let's, let's, I, I don't think it's best if you are up, up yeah, there. It, just, you need to yeah. sit down, please. Uh, so, so, so as not to have confusion. Um, and we talked a lot about who can come and speak. And if it's a lawyer if there, or an entity and there's a lawsuit going on, we talked about right at the beginning. Um, Obviously, she had some confusion or 
maybe not confusion because I thought all you had to do sign up and if you didn't have a lawsuit against the entity, I, I, she tried to explain it to me before, but there should be some, don't you think some, I mean, that's a long trip to come from upstate as y'all know. Legally How do we know? We cannot uh, do this. Our, our, we have been advised by our legal counsel Anyone who has pending litigation against this commission is not allowed to address this commission. And she does? Yes, she does. She has, it's to, against me, I know. And against this this against this commission, or this, this agency. The agency. Also, David, regarding the length of time she drove to come down here, she knew before this meeting. Yes, she, she has been to told, submitted in writing multiple times. Um, I have that from Constance and from our executive director that they told her you cannot address this, this, this agency as long as you have pending litigation against us. And we do that with every attorney. Any attorney that has pending litigation or any individual who has pending litigation is not allowed to address so us. As far as you're concerned, and, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I just kind of walked into this. I had not heard before I might have missed an email or whatever. But uh, as far as you're concerned, then... Uh, that our, our rules are very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Okay. Right. Yes. And and but but someone could submit as she just uh, the, Dan? Yeah, she can can submit the material <laughs> for can study and read and read. That is correct. And our commission and our um our legal counsel will review this and if it is permitted, we will add it into the record. But we are not allowed to, to read anything or look at anything until our legal counsel reviews anything she gives us. And then once it's done, once our legal counsel reviews it, then we'll be happy to add it into the record. I'd like to add that South Carolina Association of Advocates does not have a pending lawsuit. But Ms. Ms. Harrison, you today. do. You do, and you are listed as an attorney for a for a group that does have a pending lawsuit. If the if the group well, if they so want to call if someone the group wants to come and sit as president or something like that, they are welcome to but call. But not the attorney. But not the attorney. Not, okay, I got not, it. Or, or if it's an attorney that does not have a pending lawsuit against this agency, yes. they are welcome to. But we cannot communicate as commissioners with anyone that has a pending lawsuit against this agency, this commission, or any of the individual commissioners. Okay. Well, we, we just talked a lot about it, and, right. and, and that was some time ago, and I have forgotten. Yes. The, the the nuances of the detail, but thank you very much. That's no problem. I will have um, I will have our legal team look at this. Okay. If it is in fact something that can be put into the record without uh, without in, without impeding litigation, we will make sure it is put out on with with the information for this meeting. Okay. Is there any other public comments? There are none. Okay. There are none. All right. Moving forward. Um, Brain Injury Awareness Month. I believe we have uh, Melissa Ritter and Joyce Davis with us. And I don't know if you all got to see the beautiful mask outside. Um, they are absolutely gorgeous. And we all have these beautiful rocks on our tech desk today. I don't know if you all have seen those. Um, but we have, we have these beautiful painted rocks on our desk. And um, I know uh, uh, Commissioner Woodhead, yours is also on your desk. So you are. we will save it for you when you come back. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. So, um, as you mentioned, it is Brain Injury Awareness Month. Um, we're very excited to share what we've been doing around DDSN. Um, but first, I just want to mention that about um, one and a half million Americans experience a traumatic brain injury um, every year. And, um, there is sometimes some confusion about what constitutes a brain injury. So, this month we've been talking about concussion, which is a mild traumatic brain injury. Or this month we've been talking about that um, and we've been providing some information here to the DSN staff um, on concussion signs symptoms and awareness and treatment um, in addition to that we've included some information that the brain injury association of south carolina has put together which is a return to learn and play after concussion and it's um, been passed out to schools and throughout the throughout the state um, we're also hosting two special events today that I'm excited to tell you about. We have a Baking for Brains bake sale, and so a lot of staff from DDSN have um, have volunteered and, and baked some nice things that are for sale down the hall. All the proceeds will go to the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina. Also, we have with us an artist, um, Emily Yarbrough, um, who, Ruff, who has sustained a brain injury in 2017, I believe, and um, Painting was part of her healing process, so she's here to display some of her work and has it for sale. If anybody's interested in taking a look, they're all coastal um, kind of themed paintings and very beautiful. 
so finally, uh, as you mentioned, we have the Unmasking Brain Injuries, uh, brain, brain Injuries Project on display here. Um, and this is on loan to us from the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina. And Joyce is going to tell you a little bit more about that. But before she does that, just on behalf of the Head and Spinal Cord Injury <coughs> Division here at DDSN, I just want to thank everyone for their participation and for their promotion. And um, as Commissioner Miller said um, in his invitation this morning, um, a, a lot of what we do is related to prevention as well. So it's important for us not only to um, work with people who have disabilities, but to promote prevention of, of um, of disabilities. So I thank all the brain injury survivors that we serve and for their caregivers who provide care to care to them and um, they're the purpose behind all of these activities. Quick question. Yes. Just thank you very much for the work you do. Um, back about, and I'm, I'm kind of sensitive to this subject. I've, I've got a uh, C5 fusion and uh, so I'm, I'm very, I've been in two accidents where I've, it's been exacerbated by okay. rear end collisions. Mm -hmm. Not my fault. Um, you know, it was you know, not my fault. Um, and 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 so I am I am very very aware of the kinds of, the kinds of consequences that can come from spinal um, and occiput styled um, difficulties. Um, back when the legislature had one of their, I think there have been three that 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 I peruse um, audits. One of the audits talked about brain and spinal as a, an arena that had not, and this would might might have even preceded you because it it you know it would go back like 12, 13 years ago, something like that. I don't um, talked about um, that that we weren't reaching enough people that had brain and spinal injuries, and that a, a, a lot more could be done. And, and it's been two years since I read that and talked to some of the people that have been involved in that. And I, I would love to talk to you after commission in a week, two weeks, a month from now about uh, about that observation. And it's, it's ambiguous in my mind because it's my study of that proceeded. I, I came right on the heels of the startup of, of, uh, of the virus. So I sort of got off subject a little bit, like a lot of people did, but I'm, I'm trying to get my way back in. I'd love for you to look at that uh, LAC report and, and see what you think. Maybe you're very aware. It's OK. I, I don't need a comment on the LAC report, but maybe you could look up that report because there are a lot of things that, you know, maybe we didn't do that we should have done or that, that were suggested that were impossible to do. So if you take a look at that at some point, that doesn't have to be in commission meeting. I would appreciate your time to discuss some of the observations made there. They might be fallacious. Sometimes the LAC can get off and, and uh, not be quite practical in what they're recommending, but that's all just an observation and ask you to help me later on on that subject. Sure, matter. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. And then this is Joyce Davis. She's the executive director of the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina. Welcome, Joyce. Hey, thank you. Thanks for letting me say a few words. Um, I've been working for the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina since 2006. So before that, I actually worked here for three years. Um, so I might be able to provide a little history. <laughs> I'm kind of getting on up there. Um, but right now, I wanted to talk to you about the things that we've been doing with the, um, for Brain Injury Awareness Month. Um, we have an intern that um, Took an, had an idea about trying to do some things on TikTok, so that's one of the things that we're doing, which is really out of my out of my league. Um, we did get a South Carolina uh, a governor's proclamation for the month of March, and then I believe it's March first. I brought the masks over here. Those masks have been painted by um, people across the state, brain injury survivors, and it's it's a way for them to express their feelings. We've taken that exhibited to um, like our fundraisers before COVID. And it's a, a huge awareness uh, for individuals that have no idea what brain injury is. Um, so we're we're very proud of that project. Um, now this past uh, on March the 3rd, we actually delivered these painted rocks to all the legislators at the uh, Gresset building in the block building. So we this is another idea of my intern, which she's done a great job, but she had rocks that were painted by the support groups, our brain injury support group members, um, brain, injury, brain injury patients at Roper Rehab, at Roger C. Peace, 
It encompasses health. Um, just Babcock Center, the Phoenix Center, folks. I don't know if y'all if y'all visited that place, but that's right here on Laurel Street. But all of those folks, man, they really enjoy painting the rocks. Um, so, but that something for you to think about is that for people who have uh, fine motor skills deficits, this is a it's a hard thing for them to do. And if you have a rock that takes a lot of diff, has a different has different colors, that's a lot of processes. I mean, that's dipping your paint, your your brush into the paint, painting, and then if you want to change colors, you got it. You you know what it's involved in painting. So and then holding the rock too, keeping it steady. That's difficult for people with with uh, fine motor skills uh, deficits and people with brain injuries. You know, I mean, because it's a process, and um, but it's something that's also calming and relaxing for a lot of folks. Um, I know that this was, you know, people do this all over the you know state, all over the world. They they hide these rocks, but we wanted the legislators to have these rocks so they can remember March's Brain Injury Awareness Month, and our our folks took these rocks, told, talked to the senators and the representatives and told their stories. And I think one of the neatest, neatest things that happened that day is um, one of the, the guys that came up, he's like 30, in his 30s, but he was actually one of the ones, he, he had a brain injury as a result of a bicycle accident up in Greenville. Now this was, um, he was actually, his dad called us, he was given information about us, and we provided information about the, um, the post-acute rehab funds here that DDSN that we've been advocating for for years and years. So Lucky just so happens his name is Lucky. It's really William Joseph, but um, but he goes he's always gone by Lucky, and um, he he's received that funding to go through rehab at Roger C. Peace. So he is a product of what y'all have you know, provided to people who are uninsured or underinsured. Um, Lucky's actually on our board now, and he, because of what he went through, he wanted to give back to others. He loved helping others. So now he is actually a practicing physical therapy assistant. Uh, he went back to school and I mean, I'm just so proud of him. I mean, he's he loves to tell his story. Um, he, he's one of our mentors to help others you know, peers with brain injuries. So even if it's over the phone, um, so it, it just made me very excited. I and mean, we had a lot of lot of folks from the Phoenix Center that that helped give out those rocks. Um, and then a lot of the legislators wanted to have their pictures made with the folks. So um, it was a great day. I mean, we had like 20, 20 people, 25 people that went. Um, so we enjoyed that day and it was my birthday and they surprised me with cheesecake afterwards. So <laughs> it was good too. Um, but so y'all got a, a, it's a gem over there, the, the Phoenix Center. We, we're doing a lot of things with them. Um, and just, just wanted to follow up. One last thing is we are having a virtual 5k, uh, walk, run and roll. And that is next week, 20, the 20th through the 26th. And, um, we're just asking people to register. It's actually a little fundraiser, but. We want people to, to wear their t-shirts, take pictures, share them on Facebook, tag, share, whatever you do on Facebook um, and Twitter and all that. So just try to make the most of what we can with Brain Injury Awareness Month. And we want to thank you all for everything you do for our organization and for our brain injury survivors. Well, I, just, I appreciate the rock so much. I did this with my daughter. She um, had a spinal cord injury, but she also had a slight concussion, a little bit of brain injury with our mm -hmm. accident. And we painted rocks at Shepherd. And um, hid them around Shepherd, and you know, people would share them on the on the website and stuff. So I found mm -hmm. I found that I knew exactly what this was when yeah. I saw it. Yeah, it's got our logo and our uh, toll free uh, helpline on the back as well. So it's a great great thing to put out. And you, if you guys want to hide it for somebody to find it, I think it's a yeah. great idea yeah. to help them get their word out. So. Mine will always be on my desk with my uh, name tag. So <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you got that each, one. Each meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's the cross. Oh, that's great. Welcome oh, to my preacher. <laughs> he prays for me every time I come up. <laughs> the right place. <laughs> Let's get a sleeve here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank y'all for coming. We appreciate it. And you do have a copy of the proclamation from the governor in your packet. <coughs> um, it will be also be on our website. And um, we do appreciate Governor McMaster um, identifying this as Brain Injury Awareness Month in South Carolina. Um, now, we're going to move on to our committee business, um, the Finance Committee, Commissioner Blackwood. 
All right, um, Madam Chair, the Finance and Audit Committee met on March the 8th, and I have two items. The first one. You're on tab, tab three. It'll be tab three, yes. The first one is um, a routine a bid, a routine bid process um, that is for information only. It does not need a full commission. It's a non-service contract. Um, the agency shared with us um, a fixed price bid contract um, was solicited in February for um, LPN and RN support services. And um, the, um, the contract essentially qualifies vendors to perform the service at a fixed price. And so um, we, we, we reviewed this and talked about it and um, we, uh, the, com the committee approved the um, the request um, as it was as it was presented. So um, this one doesn't really need a, a vote. It's for information only, and you can see it highlighted in the green under tab three. Um, basically, the, the the information that goes along with that. So um, the next item, which does require a commission vote, is um, the. Um, the agency shared with the committee um, that they received bids um, for campus-wide fire alarm replacement um, at um, the Coastal Center. And um, the, uh, we spent some time talking through- Can I interrupt you just one yeah, second? Yeah. I, I, was, I was reading the Coastal Fire yeah. proposal thing while you were talking about the other thing. Uh, yeah, 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 the did, did, did I just not get a document on that? Or? No, it's um, under green was the first item that was information only that I discussed. See it in green? The highlighted area in green. Okay. That was the first. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I'm that was what the first yeah, non -service. I, I, I believe that's a different sheet. That yeah, I, no, I, I, it's all I, together on one page. And it's, okay. it's separated by. I ask that whoever prepares these in the future, yeah. prepare the green a little bit lighter. Yeah. I don't know who does these. I thought these. that was marked out so we couldn't see the CIA report or something yeah. like that, you yeah. know, where they mark out three quarters. If they don't mind, if they could go a little lighter on the dark green, that would yeah. be great. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. But it's just fine. We'll, Sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> a, fixed, a fixed price bid. I'm reading over the green there. I got, yeah. got my glasses. Okay, yeah, on. I got you. Yeah. Okay, so that's what you were talking about. Yeah, okay. that that is um, that was brought to our committee. Okay. Um, it's a not. It's a routine mm -hmm. bid process. You know, we have to bid. You know, everything. And so this was just um, permission to. Um, uh, is Candace here? No, she's the one who. So you would. The, 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 there's a solicitation yeah. number, uh, yeah. Chairwoman. There, there was a solicitation number. I see. So this, this went through the bid process, the statewide bid process, and and yes. you could look yes. that up and read about it. Yes. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm hyper about disclosure, and and as you, as y'all know, yeah. You know the, the 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 free hand that the director has. What's the number now that we got? That, the director can spend how much? Up to two hundred thousand. Up to two hundred thousand without permission from us, but we're supposed to get every four months. We're supposed to get um, you know a, 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 a listing of that. Uh, so if the, if the director ever wanted to spend a million, I, I guess it would be done in pieces and parts. It's not like you can't get get around something, but at least you'd be able to if if you were really watching to put it together. So what this bid was was and and we don't have to approve it because it was a repeat is that what uh, it was a routine. Well, a routine more than repeat oh, right. oh not not re okay right. okay a routine yeah um so the the routine. we are looking at the financial the threshold for 200 to something is over two hundred thousand dollars or more right we the the agency brings those items to us and they're they're classified in a few different buckets. The first bucket is anything that's new non-service contracts. The second is existing service contracts. The third, you can see 200 or greater. That all by way of disclosure, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, that all by way of disclosure. So yes. We have to vote it, but, but like the other cash that could be spent by the director up to 200,000, uh, it's a disclosure issue because we don't want to get involved in bids for $32,000 right. and try to review all that stuff. 
price. So they're price. disclosing this fixed price thing. Yes, just because it's over 200000 And we do it for, you know, cleaning services, linens we have right. to order for right. the anything that's, you know, mm -hmm. root. Routine and so the, the, the winter, and this is for the nurses, bid, it's for nurses. They, they win a bid, which doesn't then require the commission's approval. Is that, is that correct? Well, it's um, it's more that the it's not that this particular issue has been that they're going to we're approving that particular vendor, but it's um, it's opening up the um, it's providing us an opportunity to let us know that they're expanding the poten potential um, vendors that could bid on it. So it's not so much that we're saying, yes, we want to pick them in this example. And Candace is, is here, so I will let and, her and, and, share. And, and, it's not, and it's not so much this, this particular thing. I'm trying to understand the bid process more than anything else. And we were tr we try to get the fee for service, and I think we have got to some degree get all that stuff under control. But there are all kinds of angles that, that uh, I just want to make sure that I comprehend. Yeah, and right. I'm sure all of you all probably you know, understand a lot more than I do, but that's why I'm asking all the questions. So that's all I got. And, and I, I don't I don't want to chase this too much. I just. So basically, it's worth, it's worth mentioning that in in the past, we didn't even have before Ms. Blackwood was chairman of the finance committee. We didn't even have a process to look over these things at all yeah. unless they were over two hundred thousand dollars. So this is, our, what we're this is. I, well, it, it, well it's, so we didn't even have a process to look at these unless unless there was some specific reason to renew it. Yeah. And so our committee has done a this committee has done a wonderful job trying to figure out exactly what we what we should should approve and should not approve. But before yeah. we weren't even anywhere close to this level of scrutiny that we have now for anybody for anybody that knows. I mean, it, it was astounding that we had no no system like this at all. So, Candace, can you speak just briefly to the new non-service contract category, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about why do things appear here? What exactly you expect? You know why you put things here under that category for us to talk about. Um, this came apart with the directive, with the um, executive limitation directive, right? Um, and when I got here, from my understanding, it was not presented to the commission or finance committee meeting prior to me coming, right. or the whole transition. Um, right. When Pat became CFO, right. um, so we started doing that to bring it to um, Finance Audit Committee attention right. and laboring uh, what needs to be approved on the Finance Committee level and Commission level, just for awareness purposes. Right. Um, during the bid process, we are we develop a scope of work or a specification. It's published in SCIVO. Um, which is a South Carolina business opportunity that lets the vendor community know that we have a bid out. We have submission deadlines of solicitations. We have a Q&A um, that are met and outlined throughout the bidding process. Um, so therefore, if there is anything that is um, not presented in a manner, the vendor community has the opportunity for us to clarify anything. Um, once the bid submission deadline is closed, we evaluate those bid, bids and we deem vendors and it depends on what type of solicitation you're doing. Um, you have from an invitation for bid, um, fixed price bid, um, request for proposals, and it depends on what source and method that you're using that you follow the procurement code process to, to deem a vendor either um, lowest um, and responsible responsible bidder or the highest ranking offerer. And if it's an RFP, you go into a negotiation. So therefore, that whole bidding process is not necessarily cost driven. It's about qualifications or expertise. So therefore, you know, the procurement division and anybody that does those processes evaluate and it's an extensive process that we make sure that we are getting the lowest responsive bidder or the highest ranking offer. Quick question. 
Thank you. This is very helpful and very interesting. Uh, uh, now, how, if, if, um, if we've got a finance director and a finance committee, and then the bid process for new contracts or whatever, non-service contracts, um, or new, new, I emphasize, non-service corporate, okay? I don't want to go into what how that's defined. How, how does budget integrate the new contracts for new, for, for new activity with our budget so that everybody's in sync. I mean, how, how, how do the budgeteers understand, oh, well, wait a minute, there, there are 18 bids out there that have just been let, uh, and we've got to now apply that into the budget. Hold on, we thought we had the right numbers, but how, how do you do that? So do you integrate with, the two? with that, uh, we have an internal process here that we get a request for, for purchase. We um, get quotes if if it's applicable, um, and we submit it to budget, and they already allocate that budget there. Here's the thing: when you award contracts, we're not giving that lump sum money all at one time, especially if it's a service contract for a duration of a period. We're budgeting, um, and at that time, we don't know what the cost is going to be until the bids come in. So really. Um, you, well, the budget guy doesn't ever say to you, you guys are out of control down there in the, uh, or up there in the, in, in, in the bid room. I mean, we, we, we got a limited budget here and we're not going to be able to cover all those bids you've got out. So, so how, how do you all communicate, integrate, uh, tie in the executive director, budget committee, chairwoman? Well, Nancy Rumba. Um, is, oh, is the, director okay. of budget. That's what I wanted. So I, I wanted the, that, that, <laughs> Those funds and that is submitted to her, and she, her team signs off on it, and we don't she, execute. She's excuse me for asking, but I'm sorry. We don't. What, what group is that? The, the, the budget, budget director, budget. The budget director. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Okay. But we don't proceed with any type of solicitation or procurement until that process is being. You got eyes on it, and 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 kind of calling the shots on whether or not it's it, it's it's feasible or whatever. Absolutely, and that budget is based on what like a quote or some type of projection of what we budget for that project or for that commodity. So another example that we're getting ready to go over is the Coastal Center um, fire uh, alarm yeah, replacement. Right. So that project was included in our budget, and they estimated about four hundred thousand. I can see doing it ahead of time. Yeah. So if it's done ahead of time, 000. you got to handle it. But but it's, it would be impossible. You're saying. For for you for for the for for the letting of bids to be accepted and then you've got contracts coming in that have not previously been approved in its overall sense or whatever or maybe specifically by somebody. And Nancy, the, the budget. Well, uh, am, I, today, am I understanding this right? So so oh, you get estimates. You get yes. estimates before so before you ever. But, but, but the, the coastal one is going back to that. Okay. So we have to vote as a commission today on this one because we already approved it. Is right. if you go turn to, to, to in your to, under behind tab three under the third page, you'll see the three bids on the last page that they received on this this um coastal um fire system. So would this be the consistent way it would be done through throughout the system? Yeah, when we get to this point where we're ready to to, to execute on the project. So we could never have aberrant checks being written to anybody Not that just way. go out and and uh, somebody says write a check for this without the process that we're talking about. Right. right. That is not anymore. That is correct. Not anymore. And it should it not used be. Used to be, but it not used anymore. Not used to be, but not anymore. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll, 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 this this is very different. So okay. things okay. used to be done very differently than they are now. We tie, we tie these, are, these are yeah. all checks and balances. Okay. Got it. And I present it as you know, to you guys every month after what I learned from the, the committee, the you know, the committee meeting. And um, so the second item for today that does need a full commission vote is selecting one particular vendor that that basically won two. the bid process because of number two. Yes, number two, which is the yellow. Uh, um, number four. Um, well, it's the second item for the day mm -hmm. that came out of the committee. And so it, the first item was in green, the second is in yellow. Mm -hmm. They're all on the same page. Got so, it. 
However, the explanation for the yellow is on page behind the, the page you're looking at, two pages after. So you can see um, that this was what, we're, what we approved because the agency received and reviewed um, three bids they received for this one project that they budgeted 400,000 for in the beginning of the year with the budget. But when we're actually executing on it, we're, we've been, we're gonna be paying $313,000. So we come with, they came, they're selecting a bid that actually came in under budget, surprisingly. Um, so we gave uh, the agency approval to move forward with their recommendation for Hiller Systems to, um, to do the, the um, sprinkler system at Coastal. It came out of committee. So I have a motion and a second out of committee. Yeah. All right. So that will just simply require discussion and a vote. Is yeah. there any further discussion on this bid? When it says campus wide, does that go in every one of the facilities that they got? I believe so. Um, and, um, we discussed this before. We, 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 we yeah, because we, we approved it. Yeah. We approved part of it. Yeah about what what part did we approve before? It's, um, it's not the entire campus, it's, it's a majority of it. We started this project several years ago and we kind of started off piecemealing it. Um, so we did a couple buildings. Um, did you speak to us before about this? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've spoke to it. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember. It's, coming, it's all coming back. <laughs> it's uh, even it's from my old point. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <He's here. laughs> back to it. Like a wave. Oh my God. The 20 something buildings at Coastal. Okay. So we've done five previously yeah. in a smaller project. Right. And, just, and, and then just kind of dove into the rest of it. Thank you. And in fact, in fact, the promise was he'd come back and get approval for the amount. I remember that. But this is the rest of the proposal. This is the remainder of the campus. Yes. Yeah. So and now we'll all okay. be up to yep, yep. grade, up to, yeah. Well, this yeah. one project. It'll be all right. Great. The yeah. motion is second on four. Any further discussion? I'll signify all in favor. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Do you know the ayes have it that is approved? Thank you. Is that all, Commissioner Black? That is for my committee. Well, thank you for your work this month. Thank you. Now we will turn it over to the Honorable um, uh, Commissioner Malpers for policy. Thank you, ma'am. I am Barry Malpers. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Commission. For anybody in here that doesn't know, I'm sure everybody knows by now. And also the Chairman of the Policy Committee, which I'm thankful to be. And the first item on our Policy Committee Report today is 41308BD, which is an anti harassment policy, which basically defines and prohibits workplace conduct as it relates to sexual harassment and retaliation and hostile, you know, in a hostile workplace environment. And we had, we had previously approved this, this, um, policy. this policy, but we the staff has decided that we needed to make this easier for people to fill out, basically. And so instead of just having it on a portal, we now have it in an actual paper form where people can fill out if they have a, a, an issue in this matter. And basically, we're asking for approval to add this sheet to the back of the policy and to move forward with this policy. And that should come as a motion to second out of committee and then have a couple of votes. Okay. Um, motion a second on on policy 441308DD. Um, all in favor, please uh, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Hearing none, the motion carries. That policy is approved. And so, will someone bring me a clean copy to sign, or do I sign the one in my book? Okay, good. All right, mm -hmm. moving forward to the next policy 202510DD. Yes, that is that is policy for funding for services and it related to to the way we used to do funding around here and now we're going to be at fee for service and so this policy is no longer needed and so we are asking that this policy be made obsolete okay that's a motion and a second at the committee on funding of service policy 250 10dd all in favor, please sit by by saying aye to make that policy obsolete. Aye. 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 All opposed? None mm -hmm. of the ayes have it, and that policy is marked obsolete. Mm -hmm. Next, 
250-11-DD, um, Outlier Funding Request System. The Outlier Funding Request System is the same. We This is no longer needed because we do not use um, that type of funding anymore, and we use, obviously, fee-for-service. And so, therefore, this policy will also be made um, obsolete because Thank God we do not use a band system payment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so motion and a second at a committee. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, you know the ayes have it, that policy is marked obsolete. Moving on to, to 738-01-DD, discharge planning for individuals leaving an intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disabilities, ICF, um, IID, in enrolling in home and community-based services, HCBS waiver program. Um, this is this this is to establish an exception for DDSN regarding planning for residents who need services funded by DDSN operated under this waiver upon upon leaving a DDSN center. There's a minor, there's a minor change to this due to fee for service again implementation. There is a paragraph that's being removed and because it relates to funding and we're going to be funding a different way. And you just, of course, they're going to be dealing directly to South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, which they should have been doing for years and years and years, but they are doing it now. And at least since 2012, when we first started talking about this process, but long before that, it should have been every state in the union does it and has done it for many years. So, um, but this directive will be, will be posted for public comment after we after we come back and put the way that it will actually be funded back into the policy next month. So we're taking this paragraph out and we'll be adding a paragraph next month or the next. And so we'll hold this policy. Is that correct? The policy is being tabled until next month? No, the, the no, the policy, the, the, the paragraph is being taken out now and we're approving okay. that paragraph being taken out okay. so that people want to, will understand how they're that they're not funded this way anymore. Okay. And then they had to nuance the paragraph. That's right. We're nuancing the paragraph, yeah. basically. Okay. And we'll bring that back next And week. if you thought it was complicated here, you should have been 30 minutes <laughs> in the committee. Last step. Forth and up and down. They had, but, but we have a great staff and a great chairman. It got worked out. So that's the, the result. You know. I would like to thank Lori for that, for that purpose and those who work with her for that purpose. Um, I, do, I do the best I can, but... Without them, I'm not sure where we'd be. But I think <laughs> the staff is great. Good. Yeah, we do do a good job of this stuff. Well, um, very um, so this is a motion and a second coming out of committee to approve this with this policy change, with this paragraph being removed, correct? Right. All, right, all in favor, please do <coughs> by, by saying aye. 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 All opposed? You know the ayes have it. That motion is um, passed. I do want to give an update on both of your committees. Um, Commissioner uh, Blackwood, I'm going to be appointing um, Michelle Woodhead to your committee, okay. and I'm going to be moving Commissioner Miller to policy. Okay, so um, that'll kind of give you guys a little bit of a I request to be moved off Paul because he was, he was working me too hard. You need you need to say right where you're at. <laughs> yeah, we would we would strenuously object to that, sir. That's what I get for not being hey, here. Mr. Governor, you're on legislative with Mr. Miller. Um, and we may add some more folks if you want to be on something different, just touch base with me. But those two I knew I needed to get settled. Um, as we're doing in the committee updates. Is there any further updates um, from either one of your committees? Yeah, the code of conduct is is the four thirteen oh three DD. I'm sorry to take up so much y'all's time, but we try to stay busy in our committee. Um, <laughs> so we here. <laughs> changes to the directive were um, approved by the committee and to be and are to be presented to the full commission for um, signing without public comment. The, st the staff is because this and the staff is further researching the matter to see if there's some other things, some, some other amendments we want to make to it, which we'll make in the future. But for now, we've made we made three amendments yesterday, which we're asking to be immediately implemented because this is an important product. Important That's a gift, gift and stuff like that. It relates to gifts and yeah, things and that can be given. 
I mean, the legislature spent two years on coming up finally. This was 15 years ago with the no cup of coffee rule that everybody's familiar with. But, you know, so the question is, how far to extend it? it Barry, do you mind me jump just quick? Yeah, see, that, that, that's what, that's what that's about. So it's, it's how to define it. Quantities, whether or not a gift could be given uh, of a certain amount. And uh, the legislature kind of gave up on it. And she, she just, you know, you, you can't even give a cup, a cup of coffee. And that's how it defined lobbyist relationship with legislators. But that's not the same that we have here. And we turned it back over to staff with all that discussion that we had and, and, and said, y'all try to figure it out. Come back to us. <laughs> so anyway. Right, well, that's, what we're, that's right. They're coming back to us. But for now, this policy is approved as with the two, with the two other changes that we made. And we'll, we'll, we will go back to it. We are very, one of the many differences in this committee from, from years past is that we're very fluid and we are willing and able and encourage coming back to a policy at, at, in the future, including the bylaws, to um, fix them as necessary. So um, we'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll ask the staff, we'll bring this back to us at least in the next couple of months to um, reevaluate. Re we may not make any other changes, but we at least want to reevaluate. So, um, the only other thing is we have three other directives which are ready for public comment um, by the end of March. And after that external period, we will <coughs> bring them to the commission for approval. But there's no other thing to say about those right now. Okay. All right. Amy. And that concludes my long report. <laughs> I apologize for those that get. That's all right, Commissioner Malfers. You always do a good job and you're keeping us moving on these policies, which we like to keep refreshed. And, um, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad that y'all that committee is working so hard to, to keep us up to date. Um, we're going to go into our um, reports on old business. I do need to let y'all know um, the executive director and our legal counsel is currently in medical affairs um, meeting over working on some of our stuff. So um, oh, it was Constance back. I didn't see you back there, Constance. No, um, so when he gets to um, Dr. Fry. If she is not back for legislative update, we may um, have to make an amendment and jump to executive session and then come back and do those um, legislative, um, the legislative part and the executive director's report when she does return back. Okay, yeah. um, so we may move move executive session up if she's not back in time. Okay, we could also consider a point of comfort. We could do a point of comfort to give her a few minutes to get here from the state house. So I just want to make and you all aware of that. Come back and use that a little bit. All right. <laughs> do do does anyone need a point of comfort at this point? I'm okay at moment. Okay. Just notify me if you do. All right. Let's go on to the IDRD waiver renewal update, Lori. All right. Before I get started. On code of conduct for the policy committee, I don't think you guys made a motion, so we'll need a motion no. in order to. Oh, do we? Send, yeah, to, yeah. To, yeah to, to take that paragraph out. I'm sorry. Okay. So it's the code of conduct. The last thing, remember, the one about the gifts. We, oh, we decided right. we were going to make the changes. Go ahead and and approve that, and then we were going to do research and just further revise it down the road, unless. You've that's right. That's right. We do want to. We do want to. That's right. We do need to vote to approve that policy. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We did, we, it, it was a motion that came out of committee as a motion in second, but we need to formally approve it. Oh, so okay. those I'm changes sorry. I, just, okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we did. We had a lot of work this month, and we yes. just had the meeting yesterday. So. Okay. It, yeah, no, it's, 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 All right. So it's a motion and a motion and a second out of committee to approve those changes to the code of conduct policy that you have in your book. Uh, is there any discussion on this matter? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, the ayes have it. It is changed. Thank you, Lori. Okay. Thank, Thank you for your help, Lori. Sorry about okay. that. Um, I'll move into the IDRD waiver renewal. So yesterday we got an email from the Department of Health and Human Services. The IDRD waiver renewal is approved okay. by CMS. It was approved with an effective date of January the 1st, so they retro approved it. As you guys know, we've been moving forward with a lot of the changes that were included in the waiver, the tiers of residential, the new rates of service for the different types of day services, the increase in the limits on waiver case management. So we've been working through that. Now that we have full approval, we will begin working on the rollout of the new services that were added to the waiver. 
and just as a reminder, those are um, independent living skills, which is kind of a one to one training service. Um, re remote supports as a part of the assistive technology service. So the ability to use some remote supporting devices, things like um, medication dispensers that are electronic, um, you know, buttons for stoves, things, things like that, right? Um, and then the last one was the implementation of kind of a tiered approach in respite um, for people who live in the same household. So if a family had three um, children who were all waiver participants, there's going to be a way that a respite worker can can provide the service to all three at one time and kind of bill for all three of them at these various tiered rates so that you get paid more than a one-to-one. -one. Um, as a reminder, the Department of Health and Human Services completed and got approved an Appendix K document, which is kind of a temporary approval around the community supports and head and spinal cord injury waivers so that there would be consistency among the residential tiers and the day service rates. So those amendments were done. The CS waiver, the community supports waiver expires um, June 30th. So a renewal has been completed and it is out for public comment right now. The due date for public comment for the community supports waiver is um, March the 28th, right? Due date for the comment period. Um, so I encourage you guys to take a look at that um, and make comments. The changes in that renewal are really to make it align with the ID waiver as far as service definitions and rates, which we they already kind of did through an Appendix K, but it needs to be done formally for the five-year period. There was also an increase in the cap um, in the CS waiver in order to in order in order to address the rate increases, right? Because the the CS waiver had a cap and when all the rates bumped up, they wanted to make sure there was no um, unintended consequences of people receiving services and having to reduce them based on, on rate increases. Okay. Any questions about that? For the just for the record, do you, do you know before this rate increase in January, how long it was before its our rates had been increased? Um, I we have had some rate increases um, uh, over the years. I don't think it'd been like a, a really extended period of time, but it was really um, a big increase based on the DDSN previously DDSN build services. Um, because they were able to increase them based on cost reports that were completed for 2019. So. Finally got completed. It's a whole other story. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Anything else, Lori? I'm the next item on the agenda. Oh, you okay. are. You're there. So you should go sit down and come back up. <laughs> <laughs> I might no. call, so y'all really don't want me to do that. Please just stay. Um, tell okay. us about paper service and how great it's going. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so we continue to make progress on the transition to full fee for service and direct billing of home and community based waiver services. Um, as you'll recall, there was kind of a temporary hybrid model for January, February. Um, on March 1st, we did go live with fee for service, but not direct billing. OK, there was a little bit of a delay around direct billing to Medicaid. So for the month of March, um, we're using that same hybrid approach, but there's going to be a full reconciliation. So, um, you know, that kind of gets us to full fee for service. Um, providers for March will still get, will still bill and get paid kind of the same way. Um, the other thing that's happening in March that's a little different than what January, February is that the Department of Health and Human Services implemented a leave day billing policy for providers when we go full direct bill live. Um, so HHS is going to allow DDSN to bill for leave days on behalf of the providers during the month of March when we're full fee for service so that their reconciliation is more kind of true, um, trued up. Um, it will, however, count against the full number of leave days that that person um, has available for the plan year. Um, 
During the month of March, what the things that we've been really working with providers on are completing the provider enrollment process. I told you guys before, you know, that's something that we're monitoring on a regular basis. Yesterday, we were down to four providers who had not submitted an application. Um, we were able to reduce that to two. So right now we have two providers that we're still kind of chasing. The good news is none of those providers provide residential services, so which is kind of that big ticket. Most of them are providers of like respite and companion, those kind of things. There is one supported employment provider that we're we're trying to get um trying many, to get how many people would be affected if we couldn't get those two um i think the authorizations are very limited so it's really about i don't know the actual number but it's it's not hundreds two i'll just say many, that how many total Two out, oh, I think the total number of providers is around 100. Okay, so right? very we're, yeah, we're doing really well. HHS is really monitoring, trying to push things through. Um, and we've reached out to those folks individually. Every day. Every day. Okay. okay. Right? Yeah. So we actually have um, Deborah Leppard, who works here, has been just <laughs> incredible about trying to get in touch with people. I mean, we've even done things like try to get alternate contact information. You know, we, we send an email, we call, we call this office, we call that office. I mean, county boards. No, no, no. All the boards, all the boards are, are, are handled. So this is just a couple of, like I said, kind of small one off, one offs. Um, but they do have some open authorizations. And the, the good news is. Even if they're not fully enrolled on March 1st, as long as they get, I mean, on April 1st, as long as they get their application in, they can provide the service and then they will be retro enrolled to April 1st. It tolls so, the time, as the lawyers yeah. say. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, really, we're really working on that. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is um, assist providers with verifying and accepting all their service authorizations in their app. Um, it's directly tied to the billing module in Therap, plus it's just a requirement. Um, so we're doing some kind of quality assurance work on our end to try to identify where service authorizations are, are wrong. We're sending out emails. We're trying to get people to correct them. Um, we're also um, encouraging providers to build participant lists if they're going to use the web tool instead of Therap. The Department of Health and Human Services sent out um, kind of a request to our providers to, to make a decision about whether or not they're going to use their app at, at, at any capacity because there needs to be kind of a, an agreement that their app can receive their remittance advices. Um, so that hopefully will be handled by the end of the week. We'll know for sure who's using their app, who's not to do the billing. Um, and then we're also assisting um, providers with setting up attendance logs um, and they're up if they're using their app for billing. Okay. Well, you guys are doing good work. Mm. You're staying busy. Mm. Fee for service has been a monumental task. Okay. And I, you know, we're not, we're, you know, it, it's one of those things where we're really just trying to support providers in every way that we can. We appreciate it. And I know that, I know that this commission has pushed hard for fee for service. I know we were pushed hard by legislator, by the LAC and that kind of thing. But it's, a, it's truly a good thing. And, um, you know, I think our providers are now seeing the, the advantages of it from the ones I've talked to. And everyone I've talked to has had wonderful things to say about you and your team mm -hmm. and how you've handled things and how, you, how you've done well. And I just want you to know how much we appreciate the hard work. Because I know there have been many nights I've called up here and you were here at 730 and 8 o'clock. It has not been me alone. There have been a ton of people here that are doing a ton of work around this. Yes. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Real quick, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> I think it's going to be really interesting in six months or a year or a year and a half or however long it takes to settle out and see the curves of participation, of waiting list issues and all that to see how the system has been affected. So uh, if, if, if you can figure out ways to quantify and, and, and give, give us some measurements to, to I'm expecting I'm expecting to see an increase in the number of folks that can be serviced. 
is what I'm hoping the, the ultimate effect will be. And I know when we have discussed this at different different ones of us came at different angles and I was I was concerned about the waiting list issue. And and so maybe with a different method of service, maybe we can see a, a, a move up in that and and therefore the, the, the whole service paradigm. Um, I think it's changing and and you know, all the staff and you know we, we from different angles we had a lot of resistance but yeah, uh, yeah. congratulations on pulling this off and, and you know HHS and all the other folks that have been involved in the in the strategy I think yeah you. so I've I've been in this system for a really long time and the the collaboration with health and human services right now is at an all-time high like I, we work with them really closely on a very regular basis. They have been extremely supportive of us. We have tried to be extremely supportive of them. Um, you know, I, I'm often on the phone with people who work there at 7:30 at night. You know, we we've all exchanged cell phones, and and it you know nothing's off limits. So it's been a, a very um, rewarding process. But I, I really want to get to the finish line. I just feel, you know, it's one of those things where there's so much you just want to, you know, you want to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And I think that's where both of our agencies are. We're trying to do everything that we can. And this is might be in Director Fry's report, but Health and Human Services is actually going to issue kind of a bridge payment um, to some of the providers um, to just try to help get them through you know, this whole like that was, a, that was another switch. issue that goes back nine months, 10 months that we discussed and and and, and tried to figure out yep. how to how to make that work. So there was sure. nobody left by I'm sure. really glad to hear you guys aren't siloing, uh, be siloing. I'm yeah. glad to hear that yeah. we are actually communicating with other agencies sure. and reaching out and, and using their resources and them using our resources. That that makes me extremely happy as a you know as a chairman be able to see this commission moving forward and, and this agency moving forward in that direction. So that that's that's good to hear. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. As a point of clarity, I just want to make sure that the two groups that you have been reaching out to, you they have been responding back to you. Minimally, yes. <laughs> well, sure they have received our communication. You have not gotten them. We don't we have verification like so yesterday there was four. We have verification from two that they submitted an application. Okay. The other two, I do not have verification that they've submitted an application. So you haven't spoken to them at all. That's I'm just trying to make sure it's clear for the record. So we have spoken to them, just not yesterday. So like you got to realize we've been trying to re reach these people for, you know, we thought we were going live on March 1st. So we started mid-April really trying to get in touch with folks and it, it's just people were kind of at different levels of, you know, where they were and what they needed to do. The other thing is some of these places are kind of corporations, so they're not as concerned that they can submit a claim on April 1st because, you know, there's a, it's a corporation, they have other money, it's, you know, they'll get to it when they get to it. Johnny's not here, he needs to give me what MPI number I'm using, that kind of thing. It's also their decision whether they want to apply or not. I mean, right. if they don't want to. Yeah, I think, the, I think the big thing is they, at this point, they have open authorizations. They have been communicated with that they will not be able to bill any other way than to enroll on April 1st. You know, our next order of business is for open authorizations. We need to make sure that the people that that are receiving that service understand that there could be a point where that company said, I'm not going to enroll. And at that point, they'll just have to choose a different provider. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Under the uh, monthly report, maybe I've missed this number all along, but now we've got an estimate to eliminate the waiver list at 1.28 billion. Has that always been on there or is that a new, new It's number? always been there. I missed it, I'm sorry. Yeah. Are we, are we hoping to get that to zero? I mean, we have to go to the legislature and ask for 1.28 billion? <laughs> so, um, so those waiting lists, those numbers are, are really high. Um, and they're, you know, something that we work on on a regular basis. I think the designer of that report wanted a number for how much it would really cost um, if we, if we, eliminated the waiting list and the way that number's derived I can talk to you about this but it kind of looks at um, 
the the rate at which people actually enroll and get services based on given slot. So it's not like there's this many people on the waiting list times this number of money because like the CS waiver waiting list, for example, the conversion rate is pretty low. Um, the number of people on the waiting list when their name comes up, a lot of them just don't take it. This is, um, this is the number you would defend, though, if yes. the legislator wants to say we want to get rid Correct. of it. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Lori. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. All right. Next, Ms. Courtney Crosby uh, is going to talk to us about our internal audit update. Good morning. Good morning. So I'll start with um, an update on our agreed upon procedures report. So we're continuing to review our agreed upon procedures reports. We've received reports from all of the boards. Um, the review is complete for 16 and 23 are in process. So we have received 2021 reports on agreed upon procedures from all of the private providers that had June 30 year ends. There are nine of those. And reports for the private providers with September 30 year ends were due on January 31st. So we've received two of the three with one being late and we have reached out to them. It's on the way. Um, and the review is complete for three of those private providers. So our 2021 contract reductions are currently $27,200. So in addition to the review of agreed upon procedures, we've been focusing on um, prioritizing our follow-up procedures. So we've initiated follow-up with seven providers. The field work is complete for two of those providers and it's underway for five additional providers. So since we're nearing the end of the quarter, we'll update our tracking report for any of those follow-up procedures that have been completed since January and we'll get that out to you in early April. May I answer any questions? Commissioners? Yeah. We're good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. All right. I think, Rob, are you going to do the legislative update today? Okay, great. Thank you, Rob McBurney. On the hill. Let me, let me just say one thing about while he's coming up. I'm very thankful that we have our um, director of internal audit that comes up and speaks to us each month. That's something else. This commission changed a couple of years ago. We had this commission had not seen him in public in years. I don't know, he was living downstairs. And so um, we are thankful that, um, that that we have also changed that among many other aspects of our agency. Yes, thank you, Courtney. Rob. Okay, uh, I have a, I have a not, not very long uh, update for this month, uh, but do you want to bring your attention to some things you already know, you, we've already, you've already seen, you already know. We have a new commissioner. Uh, she was approved uh, through the Medical Affairs Committee on the day of the last meeting uh, a month ago, so uh, February 17th. So uh, and then she was approved by the Senate the following week uh, and is uh, now serving uh, as a commissioner from the 5th District. Uh, so welcome to uh, Commissioner Woodhead. Uh, also want to thank the commission for uh, being at Disability Awareness Day. There's a little advocacy day at the state house. Um, it uh, it really meant a lot to our staff and to our individuals served that, that, that were there uh, to see uh, commissioners um, at uh, at disability advocacy day. And um, I think that uh, that it was a good event and um, and we accomplished some, uh, a good bit uh, there as far as uh, bringing awareness uh, of, uh, of 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 the needs of um, our individuals. So uh, I want to thank there. I was, it was a great event and um, and uh, pretty good weather <laughs> for once uh, for once that and we haven't always had great weather there. Um, moving on to other uh, other other topics, uh, the regulations are moving. Uh, we have four regulations that we've submitted this year. As you know, the agency has been a number of years since the, since the agency has uh, updated its regs. Uh, and these uh, four regulations that we've submitted this year uh, on, our, on our timetable, um, we had a, a subcommittee hearing on uh, March the 9th in the Senate uh, to review. Obviously, we had one in the House as well. Um, 
And so what three of the regulations are being worked on, they've been uh, pulled back and are being worked on with uh, disability rights in South Carolina. Uh, we had a meeting on, Feb on February 24th, our, our, annual, our regular monthly meeting with them uh, to discuss it. Uh, and we're in the process of, uh, of making some changes if, if possible to, uh, to those regulations. Uh, and strengthening them as we go forward. One regulation, which was a straight appeal, a repeal of uh, uh, of one entire article, uh, went to the medical uh, Senate Medical Affairs Committee today, and was it approved? Approved. Okay, so it so that will go to the floor in the Senate, and uh, and that will um, uh, that will complete that uh, that regulation. Uh, did the same thing in the House so um, earlier, so we will we'll be complete on that one, and we'll be working on three others, uh, and hope to have those done, hopefully in the next in the coming weeks. Um, Want to also point out that Dr. Fry uh, yesterday uh, made a presentation to the uh, Healthcare uh, Subcommittee of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, so Senate is starting, you know, House is. Ending this budget process and finishing up work on, on the budget, Senate is starting the, the budget now. Uh, so we're in the we're back in the we start, so we start all over again back in the subcommittee uh, phase. Uh, and she made a presentation yesterday that was well received. I'll let her I'll let her talk about that uh, in her in her update. And um, uh, so that process will go forward. It will go to the Senate to full Senate Finance Committee and then to the floor in the Senate when they work on budget week. So. Uh, that's what we have coming on in the next couple of weeks uh, going. Uh, so we'll be answering whatever follow-up questions we have for that. And other than that, uh, the other legislation that we have uh, that we're watching pending, uh, there were no movement or meetings of any significance in that. Um, you know, still discussions with staff, but other than that, uh, nothing, uh, nothing moved on that in the, in the past month. So that is pending any questions. That's the uh, end of my report. Thank you, Rob. All right. All right. Let, me, um, let me just say for the record that our, our um, agenda says that the legislative update will be given by Dr. Ms. Fry. By Dr. Fry yeah. And that is not Dr. Fry. That is Rob McCurry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, did, we didn't actually know whether Dr. Fry was going to make it back <laughs> in time right. or and everything. So, as, and, you were, as you help a lot with that process. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying you look much different than Dr. Fry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for filling in for us there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, sir. All right. Uh, organizational restructure of the PD and Salibi Centers, Tracy Hunt, our new CFO. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Um, this is something that came up new where they were wanting to try to start this restructuring and came to us about that this month and wanted to do it the 1st of March. We had asked them if it would, could some, be something that could wait till the new fiscal year. That way we would have the proper accounting like um, code set up so we could charge things appropriately, especially with staff and expenditures. And I just wanted to go over what's going on with this split. It's an organizational restructure of PD Center and Salibi Center. So the current PD Salibi um, construct of a single facility administrator is not effective is what I'm being told. The span of control, which is about 45 miles apart, and lack of consistent and focused leadership at both locations has hampered compliance with governing body and client protections and conditions of participation as outlined in the state operations manual. And thank you to Janet for helping me make sure I understood this a little bit better. The creation of a Salibi facility administrator position and further separation of all operations of these two locations will improve on-site oversight of service delivery and fiscal management. So just wanted to make you guys aware of what was going on and um, looking at that potential start date. And what has happened already is they have hired for Salibi and it's no longer shared with PD from my understanding. And Lori said she could help explain more if I needed help on that. Um, and then what Janet said, what needs to happen is clear lines should be established on what will be continued and be shared. And that's where our HR is going to work with Nancy and budget to, to work on that kind of work. So we just wanted to make you aware of that um, before I went into 
the finances. Do y'all have any questions for Lori? <laughs> like <that. laughs> I was here. I, I live in that area. That is my region. And I was actually at Salibi yes day before yesterday. I was over that way. And um, it is a drive. It is it is it is mm. quite a drive. It's not an easy drive either. And um, it, it this is definitely, in my opinion, as a hospital trained hospital administrator, this is a an, a very wise decision on our behalf um, to make sure that we get these facilities actually a hands on manager on site. I mean, that's like that. to me that's that's critical. So I have a question. Sure. Um, when were they combined? Like when, when, how long have they been operated? I don't know the answer to that. I, I know that at least for, you know, the last several years, okay. it's been combined. Um, I don't know what made the decision to combine it. Probably the downsizing of facilities, you know, back a while ago, there were a lot more people in the, the centers and there were probably two, but I'm not sure what, what decision where the, when that decision was made. Okay. We can find that out for you. You might need to find that out for the record to find out when they were. were combined. So apparently it's always been that way because I just got a text from Janet. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they were combined from the beginning. From the time they, it's always been combined, but it's just not working well from a management standpoint. No other centers are combined. Right. Okay. Just making sure and, because and I never asked that question. It is unique that they're the yeah. only two centers yeah. that are, yeah. you know, within 20, 30 minutes of each other. All the other centers are kind of in different regions. Yeah. But. Okay. But basically, we're just splitting them up. Thank you, Janet. Basically, we're splitting them up and getting new leadership in both so that they can have more hands on approach to how these people are cared for, correct? Yes, sir. That's how it's explained. It sounds like a fantastic idea. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Good idea considering the budget they have. They should have two, <laughs> two, two um, directors. All right. Executive directors. As Anything they are else? Primarily responsible. Not with that, just the finance. Okay, hey, let's do finance. Gray, if you'll turn to that page, you, you'll have your spending plan versus your actual expenditures through the month of February. Um, I want to first of all thank um, the staff here. They have been tremendous. Um, learning and sitting with Debbie and Nancy has been an honor and a pleasure. Their knowledge, I mean, is incredible. And they have been explaining things to me on a daily basis. And I know I have a lot to learn, but we are very blessed to have them here. And Nancy helped prepare this report today. And we're right on where we should be for this um, portion of the year with our percentages. Does anybody have any questions about the report? I think you're familiar with looking at this format every month. Well, thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. All right. Do we need to approve that, Robin? How do y'all do that normally? Um, we have been approving it. Motion to accept. Yeah. So do I have a motion? Do I have a motion on the floor? We gotta have a vote on that. That's not just information. I, so what, what, whatever. I second the motion. So moved. <laughs> All in favor, please stand by by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion to accept. We approve it. Could, could we have a? I have a in great need, and I don't know if anybody else is. So if they're not, I'll do it myself. But. We have a point of comfort for five minutes. I'll be more than happy to give a point of comfort. Unless we want to wait that. for Michelle to do her. She's the last thing before we break for executive session. So do you? Well, I don't really have a lot of time. <laughs> Let's, give <it. laughs> Let's give a five minute break. <laughs> point of comfort break. I think that'll be fine. Yeah, I tried that. <laughs> I mean, I have to go too, but I was like, she's the last one before we go. I'm about to see you for a second. <laughs> We are back live um, from our point of comfort. Um, let's now go move forward to our um, director's update. Dr. Fry. Right. Uh, thank you, and I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to highlight that we do have a couple of procurements out there. Uh, we do. We did finally get our RFP for strategic planning posted. So. Um, thanks to MMO for, for collaborating with us on that, but we're excited about that, and that is, of course, for this commission. Um, 
In addition, we have a procurement posted for consultant help related to the assessment that um, we hope and eventually to start piloting to help us objectively um, assess the level of care needs. And we'll continue to, to keep the commission updated about that, but we're really excited about uh, bringing in some expertise to advise us about what's happening um, for best practice uh, to, to improve the, that entire process. Also, just a reminder for those who are watching, we did issue a survey to um, all providers related to our uh, electronic health records, future RFP. That survey is design, designed to solicit input about what ought to be the requirements for a future RFP. Um, so uh, we've had pretty good response so far, but we um, just want to make sure that everyone knows that has been sent. And if you haven't uh, received it, please uh, reach out and we'll make sure that, um, that, that we resend it. Um, last Monday, I had the opportunity to speak at the um, HSP Association Conference in Myrtle Beach. I just want to thank Judy Johnson, Susan Johns, and Tyler Rex again for that. It was a great experience. They had fantastic turnout and there was a lot of great information. And we had a number of team members from DBSN who um, either presented or who participated in the conference. And I know that they all had a great experience. So um, thank you very much for that. I want to highlight that we have a new facility administrator at the Witten Center. He started Monday, Craig Bird, and uh, we're really excited to have him. He has years of experience. So um, many thanks to Craig Bird. He, we couldn't have him here to introduce to you all because of the role he's filling. Also want to highlight that we have four new deputy FA positions that we posted um, or well, they've been approved from state HR and we're working on posting and marketing. And that's going to be under the FA to help provide um, support. But this is uh, my understanding is that it's been discussed previously and then there was COVID happened. Um, and we really think that this is going to be a great way to um, improve quality and just the overall operations of um, our centers. You want to define FA for the people that are oh, facility. facility administrator. I thought I I, um, I, I should have defined that. Um, also want to um, highlight that we have a new public information director who starts on Monday. We are uh, really grateful that um, PJ Pacifica, or PJ Perea, um, his name's Pacifica, he goes by PJ, is going to be joining us on Monday and will be leading our public information and communications efforts at DDSN. Um, and, and you all will get to meet him next month. Also, the next Monday, the 27th, um, our new chief administrative officer um, is starting, and that's the position that um, you all uh, approved that we add on the executive leadership team. Um, that is Dr. Uh, Pamela Harley Davis coming from DHEC, and we believe she's going to bring uh, a lot of. Harley um, Davis? <laughs> yes. What kind Harley? of parking spaces? expertise on board. We think that she's going to be a great asset to DDSN. Uh, next Tuesday, the executive leadership team, we're going to spend a one day. We're going to do our best to spend one day away from central office to um, really talk about some programmatic and potential organizational changes. As you all know, under the new IDRD waiver that I didn't get to hear this part from Lori, but I'm sure she shared, we finally had approved from CMS. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a there is an increased emphasis under the new waiver on quality, and of course, that's something that our agency and this commission is committed to as well. So we're going to spend some time um, really looking at the org chart, looking at our functions, and um, anticipate a request to go an executive session in April because we're <laughs> going to have some plans in place that we want to bring to you all to to really make sure that we are organized as an agency to best effectuate the quality aspects of the new waiver and also um, just recognizing that there are changes happening at DDS and the services that we deliver. Um, 
to everyone watching, stay tuned. You're going to get a message. We're going to set up an EVV ready webinar um, for April. We're going to partner with HHS. So we're working on calendars and scheduling for that, but we want to do that the same way that we did the direct bill, bill ready webinar. Um, so stay tuned for that. It will happen in April, but we just want to make sure that we're giving everyone an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we'll make sure we cover, you know, frequently asked questions, anticipated top pitfalls um, and, and to make that process that's happening in May as smooth as possible. Now, commissioners, do you know what EDV is? Electronic verification. Visit verification. Visit verification. Explain what, explain that because the commissioners don't know. I don't. Them, probably. You've never heard of this. Yeah, so this is a big transition that's been happening for a number of years. It's required by the federal government, and um, I'm going to give a high level, and I might let hop, Lori hop up, but essentially, you all probably have heard, and we've talked about this with the fiscal agent work, that when an individual is providing um, services, right now, everything is paper, and you have to have signatures that verify that the service was provided, and this is going to become an electronic version of that. And Lori, do you mind giving just a high sure. level um, of, of where we are? And sure, I'll, I'll kind of just try to stay up here. But so it, the electronic visit verification is actually a federal requirement around certain home and community based waiver services. And it, they really target in home care services, respite, personal care, nursing, people who go into homes to do services. Um, so the visit verification is basically a way to track where the service is happening. Um, clocking in, clocking out at the location versus somebody filling out a piece of paper and they, they weren't there. Um, it has been a federal requirement for a while. We are currently paying a federal penalty because we're not in compliance with EVV. Um, that penalty just went up in January. It was initially, I think, half a percent, a half a percent FMAP. Now it's 0.75. Um, so we, the Department of Health and Human Services operates four other waivers that we don't operate. Those waivers have been EVV compliant for many, many years. They have something called Phoenix. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Um, Phoenix and Care Call. So we have been partnering with them to try to tack on to what they're doing around EVV so that we're not reinventing the wheel. In addition, we share many common providers. So the different personal care companies are used to using the HHS system because they do it for all the people who participate in their waivers. Um, and so they'll be doing it for our waivers. So, you know, there's been, there's a work group of people that have been working on, on the EVV system, how it will work, you know, when it will work, um, kind of some of the exceptions that get thrown out, geolocation, there's all this different, um, all this different stuff that has to be, to be thought about. I think um, one of the challenges is around self-directed services because there's not a company who's managing the workers, um, it's really um, managed by the individual representative that's supervising the care, whether it be the waiver participant themselves or a family member. Um, so that's probably been the most challenging um, piece, but that's just something that we're working through. Do you have questions about EVV? Sounds like something a tallying company could figure out. <laughs> <laughs> You're using uh, a, a, a tablet with a tracking system built into so it. So there's two options, actually. There's a landline at the location, which is kind of how EVV started, right? When EVV came along, cell phones weren't as prominent as they are now. Um, they So what the way that EVV started was you go to somebody's home, you call in from their landline at, and clock in, and then you call in from their landline and clock out. So that option still exists in the EVV system. The other is really a device ID. So the idea is that any person, most everyone has a cell phone. Um, so the worker downloads an app on their cell phone. They provide a device ID. They clock in and out with their cell phone. Their cell phone has geolocation. Census uses that same tracking system. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay.
How long have you been paying this penalty? Is it like two years or somewhere around the Yeah, we're, I think we're in the second year. The first year, actually, Health and Human Services paid it for us. Yeah. Um, that was the last year, that whole year, because the idea is that we would be compliant by January 1st. It's taken a little extra time. But the thing that we boast about that there was no one wanted to fix. Am I correct? Mm, that we were no. getting a penalty about and we were like, okay, we're not going to pay a penalty anymore. We're going to get this fixed. Uh, no, I think, no. I don't think it was like in a no, fixable no. motion. It was more, you probably think of something else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't That's think really it was. We had some options at the beginning of, you know, Therap has an EBV system kind of as part of their software package. And then we had the HHS package and we made a decision to go with HHS so that it would be more simple for the providers and HHS paid the penalty while we were trying to get things worked out. Okay. Again, like I said, we just didn't, we didn't make the January 1 um, date. And, you know, I will say that there's, when you start talking about all of this and you know, Commissioner Miller, I'm sure you know, based on the, the census stuff, it's all very, very complicated. So we want to make sure there's no unintended consequences. So it's just been pushed back a little bit. The good thing is the fact that you're tying in the DHHS system. Yeah. That's an excellent move. Very good. Thank you, Lori. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michelle. No, um, I appreciate that. We all owe a, Lori a lot of thank yous, but an extra big one related to EBV because it has required a significant amount of coordination and time and energy. Um, so okay. when we get there, uh, there will be a, a big exhale and then we'll get more of Lori's time. <laughs> or or her family. Lori's going to need a vacation. Her family, this family is will get more, get more of her time. <laughs> um, Maybe we need a celebration. <laughs> we don't need to be paying fines if we don't need to be paying. That's right. right. We'll get this over. Or she um, can ride in on Holly Davis. I want to highlight something that Lori already alluded to. It's not really our news, but I just want to, I know we have so many folks who watch this. want to highlight that there was a communication from HHS that the first week of April, they will be providing essentially a half band payment um, through to, to, to the providers. Um, that communication was sent by HHS on Monday, I believe, but just want to make sure that um, there's awareness of that. Um, for everyone who, who's watching from the provider side. Uh, I suspect that Robin mentioned this um, in, at the beginning, but I'm looking forward to attending Drumming Up Awareness I tomorrow. I did mention so many other things about, <laughs> about March and how busy things have been with different things. So you can go right ahead. Oh, okay, yeah. great. So really looking forward to going up to Greenville tomorrow for Drumming Up Awareness. Many thanks to uh, Tyler Rex for sending that invitation and, and, and uh, everything. So. Um, and then we have a number of other meetings set up uh, tomorrow as well. So looking forward to that. And just want to um, uh, remind that we will uh, send an invitation. If, I think it's already out there, but if not, we'll send a reminder that on Monday we'll have our um, typically scheduled all provider DDSN uh, meeting where uh, we go through a, a high level agenda and offer an opportunity for Q&A. So um, that is our director's update. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to have you back with us today. Um, okay. Uh, now we are at the point in our, our meeting where we need to possibly go to executive session. Yeah, motion, motion to move. Yeah. Motion to move in executive session. And um, do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, the commissioners will eat lunch prior to going in session or while we're in session if you'd like to. Um, and we will be back as soon as we're done. Yeah. All right, I'm calling this back into order, commissioners. Commissioners? Okay, um, we are calling this back into order. We are rising up out of executive session. Um, no votes were taken, no decisions were made. We just received legal advice and um, appreciate those who participated and gave us that advice today. Is there any further issues before this commission? Make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, before we do that, let's say where the next meeting is. Uh, the next meeting is April 21st. 20... 21st. <laughs> That's what it says on here. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday, April 21st.
it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday, April 21st at 10 a.m. And we look forward to having you all with us. And we stay in adjourn. <laughs>